introduce Katie. Katie has become a national folk hero, as you all well know. She graduated from Aquinas College in 2011. She had dual degrees in sustainable business and community leadership, and she's working toward her MBA in sustainable business with an emphasis on public policy. She is amazing. I don't need to tell you that. You know that. At the age of 27, she founded Voters Not Politicians from her home in Caledonia, which is outside of Grand Rapids. At the time, she worked for the <clears throat> excuse me, Michigan Recycling Center, or coalition, um, and she created their first sustainability program. <clears throat> excuse me. And while employed full time, which is amazing, she somehow managed to recruit an army of volunteers across all 83 counties in Michigan. Many of us were attracted to BNP not only because we care deeply about gerrymandering and getting rid of it, but also because this organization has been so professional in the way it's handled itself. And that is a tribute in large part to Katie. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Perfect. <laughs> so the BNP leadership built an effective organization that was unlike any other grassroots organization in the history of this state. And the national media noticed. I don't know how many times she was in the New York Times, but it, it was frequent. And she was even in the editorial. Uh, she was in the Washington Post repeatedly, in the Wall Street Journal, on NPR, in the Atlantic. And now she is doing a listening tour and a speaking tour all across the country, helping others learn to do what she did. So we're lucky to have her here today. You can see her title, How 20 Words and an Emoji Led Me to the Front Line of Saving <laughs> Democracy. And after she's done, we're going to have some comments about the implementation process for Prop 2 and also get your ideas about what important issues we should engage to save democracy in Michigan. Please welcome Katie. Thank you guys so much. And seeing that there are so many volunteers here, this is our story. I hope I do it justice. No pressure. Um, but super excited to be sharing this afternoon with you. Um, I am Irish. That is why I'm wearing green. <laughs> Just to throw it out there. Not speaking about my uh, basketball references. OK. So um, the Michigan State Constitution opens with all political power is inherent in the people. And I took that super literally in 2016. And I was like, I am a people. That is my power. Let's do this. Um, I'd always paid attention to politics, um, didn't study it, wasn't really into campaigns at all, um, I, but I always made sure I voted, I really cared about local elections, the Kent County Drain Commissioner race was super important to me in 2016, um, and I know it's the other side of the state, but if you want to know more, and talk to me afterwards. Um, but I felt kind of lonely caring about politics in the very small way that I was. Um, a lot of my friends and family, I'd always try and share these articles on, you know, the systemic reasons why we are so frustrated with politics, or I'd try and talk about it uh, at dinner, and it just wasn't really the people I was surrounded by or, or my crowd. Um, but in 2016, that started to change. Uh, I was at a birthday party, and I overheard my family and friends discussing the differences between Hillary Clinton, Bernie Sanders, and Donald Trump's health care and child care policies. And I was like, what? You guys did research on what their policy stances are? And then some of those same friends and family started standing in line for like four hours to go see a presidential candidate. And I was like, I don't even think you're registered to vote. Like, this is exciting. And although I didn't completely agree with what everybody was saying, I was just really excited people were showing up. Um, and then the election happened. And I don't know if anybody's on social media. And 
anymore. Uh, but right after the election, just in case you weren't, or maybe in case your newsfeed was different than mine, it was ugly. Um, I had some people who were extremely elated and bragging a lot, um, and other people who were saying the world is over, I don't know why I bothered to participate anyways. And then all I could think about was Thanksgiving and how I did not want to go after seeing what was being posted online because I didn't want to talk about who we voted for. Because to me, it wasn't about who we voted for, it was about like the actual real world problems that are facing our country and our state and ourselves every single day. Um, and I had a theory. So thinking about, okay, why was my family more excited than usual? Especially those people who don't show up, why were they? And it was really because of Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders. And I was like, what the heck do those two have in common? So I tried to, they're old. <laughs> um, yes. And then I also was brainstorming, you know, what else could there be? And I think some of their core messages, Bernie Sanders, I believe, was the political revolution, and Donald Trump's was drain the swamp. Especially in West Michigan, I cannot tell you how many bumper stickers said drain the swamp on them, or our political revolution. And I thought, you know, those two sentiments actually sound kind of similar. They're both looking at how do we tear it all down because it's not working for me. So vote for me because I will tear it all down for you. And that wasn't actually super appealing to me. I was a very weird millennial. I was like, the you know, status quo is cool. Um, not, not a cool person, me. But, but, but I was like, you know, actually it seems like people are really frustrated with the system. And for me, why I didn't think voting in one person was gonna change the whole system is because I was really frustrated by things like gerrymandering or money in politics or voter suppression. These were the things I was hearing about in the news and was constantly concerned about, but felt like I had no ability to do anything about them. And I had a hunch, maybe we can have a good Thanksgiving if I find some common ground between us. So I made a very <laughs> basic Facebook post. In case you can't read it, it says, I'd like to take on gerrymandering in Michigan. If you're interested in doing this as well, please let me know. Smiley face. Not thinking it would lead to a constitutional amendment or being in the New York Times or, you know, meeting 14,000 of my closest Michigan friends and family friends. Um, but thinking that maybe we could start talking about systemic reform at Thanksgiving. What happened afterwards is the posts that I post that normally get no likes actually got a bunch. And I went to work, and when I came home from work, I was like, oh my gosh, like 70 people have liked this. That's crazy. And I had a bunch of inbox messages on Facebook, somebody can send you a private message, saying, hey Katie, I'm so excited you're working on this, tell me what to do, I've been frustrated by gerrymandering for a really long time. And they were all people I did not know. And I was like, how did they find me? Around the election, a bunch of Facebook groups had popped up. Um, they were private groups. I think it was like, you know, if you're voting for Hillary or Bernie or whatever it may be. And my post apparently had been shared in a lot of those groups. And so a lot of those people started seeing it. And on the post, it said, you know, you can, you know, message Katie. She'll tell you what's up. And I'm like, oh no, oh no. I called my coworker, Kelly Schalter, who ended up being on our uh, board of directors. And I said, that Facebook post I was telling you about this morning, a lot of people responded. I was like, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to enter your bedroom. <laughs> and she was like, but we have to try. And I was like, well, try what? What are we gonna do? And she's like, don't worry about it, don't worry about it. So at work, we're going on Ballotpedia and literally Googling how to enter your bedroom. That's, that's how it all began. And Ballotpedia let us know that we needed to gather 315,654 registered Michigan voter signatures. So we divided that by two because there were two of us. And we figured out that if both of us could gather about 3,000 signatures a day and quit our jobs and just work day and night, then yeah, we won't let down all these internet strangers that we don't know, and we'll be able to, you know, amend the Constitution. Then just like get a couple million people to vote on it. It'll be fine. Um, <laughs> little did we understand how big this path was before us. But I think the really exciting thing was, as somebody who did care and who felt like they were just screaming into the void all the time, never getting likes on the political posts I made, or if they were, they were from the one or two friends from college who were in a similar poli-sci class, um, I knew that something was different about this. Uh, so this set us down the path of, super easy path, 
organize and take a direction. So there's a couple ways you can end gerrymandering. You can file a lawsuit against the current set of maps to say they were drawn illegally. You can try and work with the legislature. Ha. Uh, we ended up doing research and our policy committee found that over 11 times bills had been introduced but never even voted on. When Democrats were gerrymandering Michigan, the bills were only introduced by Republicans. When Republicans were gerrymandering Michigan, bills were only introduced by Democrats. Huge surprise. So we're like, eh, we're, we're tired of them. Well, the, we'll go with the third option. And the third option was if you could write constitutional language, gather a ton of signatures, then you could bring it up for a vote in front of the general public. And I thought at that time, you know, I'm really sick of the games that get played. I don't want to have to compromise on the language in our solution. Let's go with that third one. So then in Michigan, you have to form a ballot question committee if you want to raise or spend over $500 either for or against a ballot initiative. Then we had to write constitutional language, easy, super easy, especially from somebody who spent their days literally in garbage cans sorting through waste and recycling and measuring it. Uh, then we had to gather those 315,654 registered Michigan voter signatures in 180 days, separated by county. If somebody signed twice, both of their signatures were thrown out. If somebody signed in purple pen, the whole page was thrown out. If somebody signed too big, all three names were blocked out. You guys, it seems like we have a lot of signature gathers, so you guys know the rules, but you know, follow lots of rules. We had to get those signatures verified, which cost over $100,000. We had to win a lawsuit in the Court of Appeals, win a lawsuit at the Michigan Supreme Court, secure our ballot number and a 100 word summary, and then the very easy task of getting 50% plus one of the voters that would turn out, or about two million people, to vote yes on this issue that all the polling said most of them had no idea what it was, let alone that it was bad, let alone that there was a solution to it. While learning to work with people that I just met online, Forming an organization of 10,000 plus volunteers, learning to manage projects, people, and progress with an entirely online infrastructure. We didn't actually get our first office until we'd already been in existence for a year and a half. Taking on the political industrial complex, which does not allow for actual nonpartisan efforts. The vendors you can hire are almost only for Democrats or only for Republicans. Taking on the uh, nonprofit industrial complex and saying that we want people to not need a membership card in order to be a part of this. We just want them to be able to show up. Then having about a $6 million misinformation and smear campaign ran against you, navigating all of the Michigan campaign finance laws with, uh, with tens of thousands of donors, raising a multi-millions of dollars, and then, you know, learning how to even run a political campaign. It was a super easy task. <laughs> Gerrymandered into a million different pieces and adventures. Um, but that's how we started with Voters Not Politicians. That night when I came home from work and I had called my coworker, we formed a Facebook group called Michiganders for Nonpartisan Redistricting Reform. Very catchy name compared to Voters Not Politicians. The acronym would be MNIPFER. Um, I was never the marketing person. Um, uh, and we came up with three basic rules in order for you to join that group. So because I really wanted something genuinely that could reach across the aisle, because the thing I heard and those people who are just starting to pay attention to politics is that a lot of us are really concerned with corruption and fairness and the ability for voters to actually have a voice, was I mean the first, uh, or one of the rules, that we had to uh, be able to, if you, you could check your party politics at the door, if you were gonna be a volunteer for this group, we were gonna stand for a solution that would advantage or disadvantage any Michigan voter based on how they were gonna vote. And the thing when you're changing the Constitution is you're not even thinking about right now's voters, you also think about the generations of voters who aren't even alive yet. In 30, 40, 50 years, the people who are voting are gonna have to live by this law, so we better create something that's gonna be fair for all of them, because I don't know what any of the parties are gonna be in 30 years. The other rule was that you had to be there representing yourself. Um, you could be a politician, you could be a member of an organization, but I really couldn't find any place where you could just show up and be representing you. I felt like lobbyists and politicians have lots of ways to go and already have influence as well as organizations, but where do we just get to represent ourselves as people and have a dialogue from that standpoint? And then the third way uh, or thing that you had to agree to in order to join was that we were gonna keep things um, 
uh, we're going to keep it a somewhat private uh, group, as in, you know, if we were going to try and talk about uh, our, our strategy, we don't want everybody knowing that, but that's hard with a group of internet strangers. And the other one was a, a, an agreement to action. So there was lots of places online where you could go and have a thorough debate or screaming match <laughs> over your opinions. And although that was good, this was going to be a place where we're going to be focused on what's the next step and how are we achieving what we're complaining about. Um, and, if, and if that wasn't okay with you, that's totally fine. There's everywhere else on the internet, but this one Facebook group is dedicated to this. Um, and so it began. Um, Voters Not Politicians now has uh, expanded, and really we wanted, because of our starting, to make a place for everybody. Because we are all members of this democracy. All the decisions that are made impact all of us. And that was really core to who we are and who we continue to be. So our vision is democracy where the will of the voters, and not politicians, or special interests, drives political decisions and public policy. Our mission is to strengthen democracy by engaging people across Michigan in effective citizen action. Basically, our name meant voters should choose their politicians, not the other way around. Um, so we're never anti-politician, just to clarify that. It's all about the line drawing. Um, I'm guessing you guys know what gerrymandering is. <laughs> yeah, so we'll go through this pretty quick. But the great part with gerrymandering and how we could actually start communicating about this is it's super visual. Um, although a funky looking district doesn't necessarily mean that something fishy is going on, it often does. And it usually could cut through a lot of the back and forth banter on, well, is it really gerrymandered? Is it just how people live? Because you show them a map and you can't really argue with it. Um, redistricting happens in a couple of federal, uh, there's a couple of federal mandated laws. It has to happen once every 10 years. You should have roughly equal population. We have to follow the Voting Rights Act. But besides that, actually the states have a lot of power to choose how the lines are drawn. Um, in Michigan, most recently, our legislators had decided that they draw the lines in the state. So the people running in the election get to literally choose the people that they want to be running for. Here's an example over here. I'm sure you guys have seen it a lot with the 11th, 9th, and 14th. This is my favorite, Farmington versus Farmington Hills. Just a little cut out there. Um, but when you think about, is this a community? If I was to go and try and get with my neighbors because we were genuinely concerned about something going, going on in our community, could we even go to one person in order to hear, have our voices heard, or hopefully help that somebody is worried about our little perspective in Washington, DC? Um, over by my house, here's the 76th, uh, that's a house district, yes, right here, separating Grand Rapids and East Grand Rapids, there's no city in between those, just as a heads up, just that little sliver, I guess, doesn't belong. Um, what's really funny is this is one street, it's actually behind Aquinas College, where I went to school, and you have the 73rd, 76th, and 75th across six houses, you have three different house districts. And um, as part of the campaign, maybe you guys saw this, I very embarrassingly ran across all six houses. It took me 46 seconds, and I'm not in shape. It was in the middle of the campaign. I was super not in shape then. Um, so to be able to run through that in 46 seconds, it just kind of shows the, the reality of what this looks like. Um, we actually talked to people who lived on that street who were like, my polling place changes all the time. I get so much mail. I get people who knock on my doors who literally are not running to represent me. And if you think about if all their kids are going on the same school bus to school, and they do have, again, a shared concern, how do you get anybody to try and care about your six houses that happen to be in the actual 76th district compared to the other ones? Um, and that's what leads to a lot of frustration. And it also leads to politicians who even want to do their jobs, not necessarily being able to realistically do it in a good way, because they're trying to represent like 70 fractures of communities instead of a couple. This is one of my favorite too, sorry for all the West Side references, but Justin Mosh's district, uh, for the first time ever, Grand Rap or Battle Creek and Kalamazoo had been separated. So I'm sure most of you know, you know they're nicknamed the Twin Cities. A lot of people live in either Kalamazoo and work in Battle Creek or vice versa. Um, and they actually share an airport that is cut in half by this map. So Justin Mosh says, okay, well I vote on federal, you know, airline regulations, and yet I represent half of an airport. So I'm not sure which half, you know, or, or what, what uh, I don't know if I should divide it by airlines or whatever. Um, but goes and says, you know, if the people of Battle Creek and Kalamazoo wanted it to be drawn that way, fine. But I don't think they would have. I don't think that Grand Rapids and Battle Creek have more in common than Battle Creek and Kalamazoo, or even Kalamazoo and Grand Rapids. Um, and that's, again, it goes back to, it's 
us as people and voters being looked at as a political pawn instead of actual people who need representation. Um, as part of my day jobs, uh, <laughs> both in the grocery industry and in the recycling industry, I did have to go to the legislature every now and then, didn't write policy or anything like that, but it became really, really frustrating um, when you could clearly see that the best interests of people were not being put first. So we have a ban on banning plastic bags in the uh, state, uh, something I'm uniquely qualified to be an expert on, actually, because I cut my teeth uh, uh, doing sustainability in the grocery industry. I set up the first sustainability department for uh, Spartan Nash, which is like Family Fair, D&W, Glens, all those kinds of mom and pop grocery stores. Um, grocery stores do not want your plastic bags. It is very hard to recycle them. More trash comes back with them. It's actually like a health violation oftentimes. That's why new bottle receptors have to be in different rooms. Um, and they're not going to self-correct, is pretty much what I'm going to say. Like, like there's not a lot of incentive to, for, to self-correct, especially for mom and pop grocery stores, where they have a very slim profit margin. Because uh, it costs more money to recycle those than that. So anyways, a community is organized so that they could ban plastic bags locally. I'm at the hearing, and I'm like, hey, like this is not good, and whatever. And it turns, and they end up voting for it really quickly. They just dismiss that I even gave testimony. It turns out the next day it gets released that you know, this fundraiser was held for the head of the committee and Meyer had just donated $5,000 to him the day before and it wasn't a bribe, it was just a coinciding fundraiser. I was like, really? That is so blatant. <laughs> like, like, why are we outraged? But it happens all the time. I mean, with the emergency manager law, probably one a lot of, of more people are familiar with. And then uh, attaching a dollar appropriation to laws that are passed so that we can't get rid of them. And I think it was just how little people cared, it seemed like, how, how used to it the politicians were when you would go and talk to them, and how it was just the way business is. And I was like, that's not the America, but certainly not the Michigan I wanna live in. And I think that's what we started hearing everywhere, and a lot of people were frustrated with the system, and so when you can point and show that this is a systemic, you know, do you think that it's fair that, pol do you think politicians would take this to, uh, take the advantage of drawing their own district lines to favor them or favor their party? I mean. I don't think I ran into a single person who was like, no, I don't think so. <laughs> I think they would just do what's right. Not, not a popular sentiment no matter where you're at in Michigan. So when we were looking at what can we do to actually change this process, we really wanted it to focus on changing who was drawing those lines. So from our Facebook group, I was going into the weekend and uh, saw that we were headed a billion different directions. So I was like, you know what, we should make committees. Let's make committees and made up what I thought different political committees would be. I wish there was more science behind it, but literally this is a lot of like, Katie's worked in corporate America and we're gonna translate some of that to, to political organizing. So we had a fundraising committee, a marketing committee, an education committee to figure out how do we talk about this, an outreach committee to figure out how do we find other partners, a policy committee so we could figure out what are even our options legally, um, and we had a couple others too. We had a great IT committee eventually, and a volunteer engagement committee was kind of like an HR committee. And, and really, part of the other reason why I was doing that is we, when volunteers were first joining, you had to fill out a really intense survey saying, why were you here? How many hours a week could you volunteer? What are the skills that you have that you might want to use? And I started seeing some absolutely incredible people on that list. Like one of the people had ran the Michigan Renaissance Festival for 10 years. I was like, what? Why are you here? Why are you volunteering with me? I don't know what I'm doing. You know, there's all these like, really cool people who, um, especially retired, who have just had incredible careers and were like, I'll give you three hours. And I was like, ah, those are gonna, I'm gonna use your three hours so wisely. Because I just saw this huge amount of knowledge that I knew I didn't have, and I also knew could translate into helping us figure out how do we forge this path forward. So from those committees, you could self-select into it, or if you didn't really know where you fit, we literally, like, by hand, went through and read your profile that you did, and we suggested what committee, based on what projects we needed. From those committees, we knew our big tasks. So for knowing the constitutional amendment, we knew that write constitutional language, gather signatures, get on the ballot. There's a ton of mini steps in between that, but those were our big ones. So then we did milestones off of those, and we had a really large spreadsheet system that we said, okay, let's just plug people into projects and figure out how it goes. Uh, <laughs> there are ups and downs and some committees did well and some didn't, but that's honestly how we started. 
And our policy committee started with a really amazing job. Uh, Nancy Wayne, who some of you may know, was a environmental lawyer at the University of Michigan. And she was really used to law clinics, actually, and looking at policy. So she broke it down. What are all the questions we have to ask in order to figure out what is a good solution? Um, and we started with analyzing all the other states that had anything that wasn't politicians drawing their own lines. Policy committee comes back. It's this beautiful uh, list of recommendations based on, what, you know, we had even done interviews with those states and people on those commissions to see what they would have done differently. And we had a lot of people who had been working on this for a long time who had a lot of really thoughtful opinions, but something was just not rubbing me the right way. I was like, you know, I think this is really good, but part of the problem with redistricting is that you have this small group of people that meets behind closed doors once every 10 years that makes these massive decisions that ends up impacting all the rest of us for 10 years at a time. So although I trust all of us in this room and I trust their intentions, we are kind of in a like closed door chat room, even though I don't even think we had met in person at this point. So how could we try and get a lot more input on this process and what it should look like? So you came up with the idea of doing town halls. Um, at the time, a lot of legislators were refusing to hold town halls. And were like, if they're not going to, we're going to. We're going to go out and actually talk to people. And we had one volunteer from the UP, Upper Peninsula, um, not used to speaking in Michigan right now. So you guys probably know the UP, which is nice. <laughs> from the UP, who really early on had said, you know what? If you don't ask my opinion, uh, I am going to stand against this. I don't care if it's the best solution ever. I am so tired of people ignoring me and you trolls downstate deciding everything that happens for all of us in the UP. And I was like, oh my gosh, I don't even know who you are. We don't even know what we're doing, but sure, we'll ask your opinion. And I decided we were going to ask her opinion first. So for these town halls, the first one was in Marquette, Michigan. We had three days notice to get the word out to people. And at these town halls, what we wanted to do is we wanted to talk about, okay, what are the basics? What is gerrymandering again? What is redistricting? Let's get a refresher. What does it look like specifically in Michigan? So what are our roles? What does it look like over the decades? Who's done it? How's it impacted us? What does it look like? What could a future look like that doesn't include that? So we highlighted five other states and what those states did. Um, very different examples, not all an independent commission, but you know, trying to give people an idea of what, what, what are the possibilities. And then the coolest part is we had Davia Downey, who was one of our board directors uh, and who was, uh, is a poli-sci professor over at Grand Valley, designed a survey mimicking the policy team's research. Designed a survey that went over, you know, who should draw these lines? Do you like that politicians draw these lines? Should it be somebody else? It went over what are the criteria that should be used? Should you be able to target somebody based on them being a Democrat or a Republican and try and make their vote count more or count less? Should we be looking at things like communities? Should it just be a grid? What should it look like? And then the last part was, what should the overall process look like? Do you want to be involved? Should we have everybody be able to vote? <laughs> should we have nobody be able to vote? What should this actually look like? And we asked people their preferences. That first town hall, we had our uh, news team call up. We had a bunch of retired reporters who were really helpful. They were calling up. We were, I was on like the radio. I didn't know how to be a spokesperson. The person thought we were talking about the Electoral College. I was like, no, nope, something different, sorry. <laughs> While on live radio, which is terrifying to try and correct and be friendly and be like, oh, Electoral College is cool, but that's not what I'm talking about. Uh, I learned a lot <laughs> really quickly. <laughs> And it's the end of February, 2016. It's during spring break, so really, is anybody going to show up to this town hall? And we have 70 people, standing room only, in Marquette with only three days notice for an internet group nobody had heard of. Yeah. And yeah, and that's when I knew. That's when I knew. Actually, I knew when everybody responded to the Facebook post. But seeing that, it was very clear that people were hungry to be listened to. That you had a lot of really thoughtful people who were going to take their Sunday afternoon and show up without maybe a lot of guarantee that it would be worth their while and give us a chance and to also give their community a chance to actually listen to each other. We launched with eight town halls, but quickly we had people calling us and offering to find places, and we had we didn't have a bank account yet, so it was literally finding every place you could have a free meeting in the state of Michigan, including in a McDonald's. Um, no joke, they have free Wi-Fi. <laughs> I think it was in West Branch. Um, yeah, that's a good one. Um, and 
quickly, we then changed our methodology. We actually had Rena here as this person who was like this mysterious Rena to me who was like, see if we have anybody who signed up in any of these communities because we're just going to show up tomorrow and we're hoping that somebody can lock the room or we need to find a volunteer to reserve this library. It was all very on the internet, going as we could. But we ended up holding at least two town halls in every congressional district, so we added some theory along the way. We had online ones, and I think we even did one in a different language, too, to try and get feedback from as many people as possible. Because we really wanted to have this be something for and by the people of the state. I was maybe too naive to understand that normally when ballot initiatives are done, you already have the language, or it's from some special interest group who've helped not that that's even bad, but who have helped create this in other states, and they're the experts, and so then they get to say how it goes. But I was like, I think we're all very you know, capable of being able to participate, so why don't we try? And if we're gonna need people to vote on it anyways, like my theory was, like if they have some input, hopefully they'll like what we write, because they'll help, have helped write it, so hopefully they'll vote yes. And the cool thing about those town halls is almost at every single one, it was standing room only. Just so many people wanting to participate and give feedback. Um, we, I don't know how effective this was, but we wrote letters to every mayor and township supervisor of a city that was over 3,000 people, inviting them and telling them where their closest town hall would be because we're like, hey, we're going to be putting this thing in the Constitution. We're just starting. We don't have networks in every single community. Please make sure you come out. Um, and we tried our hardest to really reach out to as many people as possible. We then uh, we're getting connected as well to a lot of the nonprofits who've been doing really critical work on this for the last decade, especially with education. I think the great part about those organizations who have been doing so much education is when I said, hey, who wants to take on gerrymandering? The initial group of people knew what gerrymandering was. I did not have to convince them what that was. Our media and our nonprofits in the state had done a really good job letting people know that this is one of the reasons why you're frustrated. Um, and so we took best practices from across the country. We tried to make sure those um, especially most impacted communities that we uh, knew that we didn't have enough time to reach everybody in were at the table to give their feedback and um, some of those organizations could make sure that we were being considerate of uh, what's best in other states. And we wrote some constitutional language. Um, it's probably one of my favorite parts because we had a couple different summits where we would take all the feedback from the town halls and then we were trying to make the decisions as you went through. And I was looking around the room and garbage person. And I'm looking next to me and there's a birthing doula and there's a veterinarian and there's a stay at home dad and there's a retired mailman and there's a bunch of lawyers. Um, <laughs> and at first when we all started, everybody was like, as a Democrat, as a Republican. And I was like, as somebody who hates both parties, um, <laughs> But that quickly faded away. And you just saw that even though people were really passionate about the ideas that they had researched and that they you know, had made their best um, uh, effort to think was really best, we were also thoughtful towards each other. And we made compromises. And we really tried to stick to the integrity of creating a solution that would advantage or disadvantage any person based on how they vote and being true to what the will of the people of Michigan would want. And it was like one of those things where you like hope that democracy is that way. Like you hope that every policy is crafted with such intention. I have a theory maybe that it's not, but I hope it is. And it just felt like what you're supposed to do. What I always envisioned democracy, like in fourth grade when you're getting fed, like we threw tea in the river, um, uh, uh, you know, the uh, Boston Tea Party. Like I was like, that's what this is. It's all of us coming here together to have a plan. Um, what was really interesting from those results is that even more unpopular than current legislators drawing their own line, which 87% of the people said no, they shouldn't, was lobbyists, which I thought was very interesting. Um, and where we had a lot of like strong correlation, there was very clearly a preference from the public. That meant that we were for sure doing it um, as long as it was legal. Um, and then where there was like less agreement, that's where we really looked at the research. Uh, mostly the feedback. Uh, came and we ended up using this a lot, uh, a perfect fit for Michigan, fair and partial transparent. But the themes of feedback that we got from people, again, across the whole state, um, was that people really wanted a system that was fair. And what they meant by that is they felt like neither party should be able to ever take advantage of it. That if Democrats were going to be at the table, then Republicans and independents and third party voters should be too. Um, and that it really should, if we're going to say we're drawing these lines um, in an impartial way, that it should be that way, which brings the next criteria, impartial. People were very scared of the government interfering with this commission. 
Um, I think it's because we had a lot of people who had been involved before and maybe had solutions that they hoped would work and then got undermined somehow. That's also why we were going with the constitutional amendment. For a constitutional amend amendment to be overturned, the people of Michigan would actually have to vote on it still. So we wanted that guarantee that the legislature couldn't just change it completely during lame duck, which you just saw. Um, and we really wanted them to be able to operate independently of the current existing political structure too, which is a lot of why um, we exclude from the commission politicians and lobbyists being able to directly draw the lines themselves. And then the third one, which was actually the most heard across the state, no matter what city, county we were in, was transparency. People are tired of that behind the closed doors. They want to see what's going on. We have the internet. Why don't we use it? I want to be able to see and comment on what the commission's doing, but especially, I want to be able to take the data they say that they're using to draw those maps and replicate those maps. Because there is no reason why I shouldn't, especially if it's going to impact 10 years of elections at a time. So with all of that, then we had to gather signatures. Um, so even while the policy committee and the education committee are running around the state getting this feedback, our field team was still already in the works. Um, Jamie Lyonzetti, who was our state field director, she at every town hall, or if she wasn't at them, she made sure the rest of us who were at those town halls was letting people know what is the reality of trying to get this on the ballot. We knew we didn't have money. We were telling people, you know, we need $40,000 to just print petitions. So if each of us could find four friends to donate $25, we could get there. It was like a democracy pyramid scheme, but a good one. Um, <laughs> and then we knew that um, she had done the math, which I need to redo, but basically saying that, okay, if we can get this many volunteers and that many volunteers can commit to gathering 15 signatures a week, we could actually be done a couple weeks early and have more than enough signatures to qualify for the ballot. So as everybody, especially in the media, is telling me every single day, this has never been done by all volunteer without an existing infrastructure, you need $3 million, you guys have like a thousand, what are you doing? And I was like, well, we've got people, we've ran the numbers, and we believe we can do it. And everybody's like, no, you don't. I'm like, well, we do. <laughs> and so, and we had based, you know, we had people already starting to organize by region, um, and actually those town halls had been really great for giving us an initial donation base and an initial volunteer base. So that as people signed up, we were then figuring out what are all these rules and how do we follow them. So all the committees, even if their main task wasn't up, were always busy throughout the whole um, campaign. So these were our, our rules, 180 days, 315,654 registered Michigan voter signatures. They all had to be registered Michigan voters. And here's our results. We were on time and under budget. So yeah, this is awesome. all of you guys saw clipboards, had a clipboard signed, um, but we were everywhere. Um, and we actually had to beg people to stop gathering signatures because it actually cost us money each signature we gathered uh, because we had to verify them. And again, if somebody signs twice, both names are thrown out. But in 110 days, we had already gathered over 425,000 signatures, actually over 440,000. Um, there's At the time, there was no requirement where you needed to gather those signatures, and we had gathered them from all 83 Michigan counties, which our signature verification firm, who's been working on this for decades, is like the top one that's ever used, said they had never seen a campaign did that, that had done that, and we did it in 40 days. Yeah. And to me, what that meant was that actually getting in the car and driving to all those places to do the town halls was so worth it that people, no matter where they lived, care about the policies that impact them. It's not just cities like Ann Arbor or Lansing or Grand Rapids. It's also rural communities. Um, I had gone to Sandusky in the Thumb, and after the presentation, it was like it was just very odd to me because it was the first really rural place I had been, and all of them said, "Why, why are you here again?" I was like, I'm, I'm just volunteering and you know, we're trying to do this and we wanted to make sure we heard from your community. And the people there said, no politician, including the ones who run, have ever come here. Not during the campaign, not after they're elected, like literally ever. And they were like, like I remember this lady like handed me a $100 check and I was like, whoa, that was like the first one we had ever gotten. I was like, oh my gosh. And she was like, I don't know how to participate in a political campaign, but I'm so glad you actually came and asked my opinion. And I was like, well, we'll teach you how, because we need you to gather the signatures, but thank you. 
And I could really tell that it mattered to people. It was much like that UP Uber who had really said, you know, I'm tired of all these decisions and never having a say. When we gave people the opportunity to come have a say, even though, again, we had no authority, <laughs> we were just a random group of internet strangers, they were so hungry to it, and they also really wanted to and stepped up to it. And that's what we saw, too, um, from those town halls, especially making sure we had done two in each congressional district. We had an army of volunteers across the state that were gathering signatures. Um, we had a 92% verification rate. That means how accurately people signed. The number one reason that signatures were not verified was like people just forgot which address they were registered to vote in. So it was you know, signer error, not circulator error. And that's, most campaigns have around a 73 if it's a really good verification rate. So the fact that we were all volunteers, most of us doing this for the first time, it meant something. And we had just under 4,000 unique individual circulators. We had some people who couldn't gather signatures because they either weren't registered to vote, um, and you have to be registered to vote in order to gather signatures who are doing data entry. Uh, we had people who are doing those education town halls, some people who just wanted to work behind the scenes. And so we had about 5,000 active day-to-day -day volunteers. Um, we had a database that was entirely <laughs> created from scratch. Uh, Greg, who's back there, is amazing. Uh, and him and Jack, uh, or a part of our original IT team, we're figuring out how do we stay connected as this all internet group to make this work. There's a live counter, you can see how many signatures you individually gathered, how much your team had, how much your region had, and having achievable goals really ended up mattering so people could understand the progress they were making. 180 days sounds like not a lot of time to gather that, much, that many signatures, but if you're hitting the pavement every single day, that's a couple months. So not hearing an update on how well you're doing or how well the team's doing, it can feel, I think, overwhelming or, or like, you know, it doesn't even matter that I'm showing up. So making sure people understood how any contribution you were making really did help us achieve that big goal mattered. And one of the things I really like pointing out too is that if those 425,000 people wouldn't have stopped to actually give us the time of day and have a conversation and sign the petition, we would not have made it on the ballot. This was half a million people in Michigan saying, this is worth my time to participate in democracy so that we can even just get on the ballot. That wasn't them saying yes or anything like that, but we literally couldn't have done it without that many people showing up. Here's, uh, we divided the state into, at that time, actually 13 regions, but here's 14 regions. We had, you know, knew where our captains were, and basically from those 14 regions, we had a regional field director in each of those. Those regional field directors had captains who then would manage a team of anywhere between four, and I think our biggest was like 46, and probably should have been two teams at one, or 76 maybe. Um, but a big range of, you know, individual circulators, and that's how we distributed uh, petitions as well. So I just have a couple pictures from some of the places we went that are kind of fun. This one is, I don't know if you guys have heard of Art Prize in Grand Rapids, that happens. That was one of the pieces signing, which I thought was fun. Uh, we were everywhere. We found, we got, uh, we had a series of movie theaters that actually let us come in and gather signatures. Um, this picture is one of my absolute favorite. It's actually a guy in his cow pasture signing. Oh. <laughs> um, uh, and the same day was the Detroit Jazz Festival that we had people at who also posted pictures. And I was like, this is Michigan, like cow pasture plus jazz festival. Like we are a diverse state. Um, we had local businesses, so Presto Print that says, and gerrymandering sign here August 31st. Um, and we tried to have fun with it. I mean, I think so many times politics seems unapproachable because it is kind of, you're either in argument mode or it's not a lot of great stuff happening. And I have a catchphrase of like, who said democracy can't be fun? Why don't we figure out how to engage people and get them to actually stop and talk about this wonky practice that's been going on since our representative democracy started. Um, we uh, had costumes. We still have the patterns for all of them, so if you want to visit your representative in your district, I can hook you up. Um, carved out of pumpkins, making signs, uh, lots of songs. Uh, I know most of you in this room probably know this, but did you know that Independent Citizens Redistricting Commission has the same number of syllables as supercalifragilisticexpialidocious? Um, yes, so I'll just do the one verse, but Independent Citizens Redistricting Commission, 420,000 people signed a petition to say that voters ought to pick their politicians. Independent Citizens Redistricting Commission. Yes. And fun 
on and made it so that instead of politics being the thing you dread or you're worried about losing friends over, it was actually something engaging that we could participate in together. Um, this is one of my favorite pictures. These are our petitions being buckled in because they were so precious to us. Um, we pretty much pony express these across the state. So when we first looked at shipping, we were like, oh my gosh, it's gonna cost us over half a million dollars to mail these things. And we were like, we do not have that kind of money. Like, we really, really don't. I was not a secret millionaire. Um, and so we, part of dividing up everybody geographically and saying, you know, your team is literally the people who live closest to you was so that we could distribute materials in an effective way. And so um, right after we got approval for the petition, I actually, for my day job, had a retreat up north, and I was the one who drove the petitions over the bridge to the UP, met in a hospital parking lot. Four people I had never met before met me there. They just took the petitions and left. I was like, oh, okay, and they went four different directions across the UP to, to spread democracy. And I remember like looking around and I was like, nice meeting you, and just like drove back down the bridge. <laughs> but that was VMP, you know, you're meeting in library parking lots, passing off the papers. It was, you know, in living rooms, and all of a sudden, you know, we had this community of people who were all knowing and looking at this huge task that every single person was telling us every single day was impossible, but seeing the reality and living the experience of people. I was at the Allegan County Fair. We had a line of people waiting to sign or hear about what we were talking about. I felt like I was selling something. I'm like, oh yeah, come here, stop for a democracy. Well, I draw the lines. You want to draw the lines? And it was a whole experience, though. I'm sure you guys have the I Voted stickers. We tried to like copy that since everybody was their selfie with I voted. Did I sign? We mostly worked at events with those, but just finding different ways to engage. Um, this is Dabby, I just love this picture, uh, who was one of our board members, the one who made the survey uh, going through and celebrating. Um, but we eventually got all of our signatures. I think some of the top lessons from that field, um, from the field experience was one was every team and volunteer matters. As the person who made the Facebook post, I get way too much credit for this. Like, if thousands of people wouldn't have put their lives on hold to de get, dedicate their time and energy and talent, and honestly to be open to trusting people they had never met, this would not have happened. Democracy is like a participation sport. Like, if I was the only one off of the sidelines, we would have never gone anywhere. Um, one of my favorite stories actually centered around Andy Fanka, who maybe many of you guys know over here in Ann Arbor, but um, it actually starts with a, a woman named Rebecca. She was one of our first earliest volunteers, and I was talking to Rebecca, and she was like, you know, I just don't think I should be here. I've never done this before. I've never done a political campaign. I don't have any skills. I'm useless. And I was like, what are you talking about? So I called her after work one day, and I was like, come on, Rebecca. Is there anything that you have or you think you could use? And she's like, you know, I have one hobby. And I was like, sure. What's that? Well, well I'm sure it'll fit into one of the committees. She goes, you know, I'm a, I'm a wood carver. I was like, oh, oh crap. <laughs> <laughs> okay, wood carving, that sounds great. I'm sure we need that somewhere. Um, but we brainstormed, and we thought, you know, maybe we'll try and carve the districts out of wood and submit it to Art Prize. Um, she actually tried, and the districts were drawn so crazily that they would have, like, toppled over on children, and that would have been a liability, so we quickly scratched that. But she figured out how to design them so we had our first signs where you could actually hold up your district. Um, and she actually ended up leading our education committee for a while. And then when we came to our, uh, our very basic tool that we needed, another thing that we wanted was anybody, no matter where they live, to be able to participate in this campaign. It shouldn't just be that you live in a city or that you have enough money to participate. Like, how do we make it as accessible as possible? And we needed clipboards. The reason we need clipboards is beyond the standard size with our petitions, we actually wanted about three inches more so we could collect names and phone numbers or emails from people because we weren't an existing organization. So if we're going to be talking to half a million people, even if we get 10% of those people to stop and give us their names and emails, we'll be that much farther and making sure they're updated on actually voting on this. So uh, we're looking at clipboards. We just priced them out, and it would have cost us about $9 a piece even buying them in bulk for 6,000 people. And we're like, oh, no, we cannot, we cannot afford that. And so Jamie, I think, was the first one who on our Michiganders for Nonpartisan Redistricting Reform Facebook group was like, you know, I remember we had a wood carver. <laughs> and she's like, could we make this out of wood? Anybody, can we make our own? So then this conversation gets going, and it turns out we have like three wood 
Carvers. I'm like, great, perfect. And Andy was one of the, uh, he was the regional field director over here. I think he ended up leading this, but basically we come up with this scheme to create like a wedding registry at Home Depots and Lowe's with the size of wood, it was masonite wood and whatever sheet size we needed so that people could directly just buy them at Home Depots and uh, donate them. And then Andy found some warehouses, I think he worked at one of them, where we could go after hours and cut our own clipboards. And so for the first time, me meeting many of these people I talked to online, I pull up after work, it's like just starting to get dark, like 7 or 8 p.m. to this warehouse. I'm like, okay, get out. And I see like this army of people, like 7 or 8 people, like chugging along with clipboards, and we ended up cutting 6,000 clipboards in one night, making it so that for 10 cents a piece, everybody could have this super professional looking clipboard, all because we had a wood carver. You know, we probably wouldn't have thought about it otherwise. And that clipboard, because we were looking at it, we ended up figuring out, can we put a local map on the back? Let's put the you know, directions on the front. But we thought about that tool more than probably any other campaign ever has because we had to find a way to afford it. But it led to the, one of the most powerful pieces that we actually ended up having and finding a place for our wood carvers. Um, the other part I think that I already talked about was those achievable goals. So I think I am not the only one who has 315,654 registered Michigan voter signatures memorized. I guess half of this room knows that number. Um, and it's because we knew that we had to do that, just like we knew how many voters we needed to reach. And by actually breaking it down and not just saying, oh, I'm ending the Constitution, that sounds hard. But saying, you know, it is hard, but here are the actual goals. We could always celebrate the next victory. So even when we formatted our petition properly, we like threw a party. Um, when, when we got our um, form approved, we threw a party. When we gathered the first 100,000 signatures, we threw a party. If you don't celebrate and actually take time to see like we are achieving this step by step, then it becomes a really long two years that would, literally feels like a roller coaster. And the last one was it was a shared success. Um, and I hope it was, anyways, I guess you guys are kind of the test of that, but a huge part of what I tried to do from the beginning was, you know, I didn't want to lead, actually, at first, at all. I was like, I literally just made a Facebook post, why does everybody keep looking at me? <laughs> um, but it became pretty apparent that we, you know, when an organization would invite us to their meeting, they wanted one person to come, kind of bothered me, and I was like, you know, I'm not more important than anybody else. But we always tried to talk about how this was our responsibility. If the voters of Michigan want redistricting to look differently, nobody is gonna come in and save this for us. Like, politicians don't have the incentive to, special interests doesn't have the incentive to, so if we're gonna do this, it is up to all of us to show up and to make sure that we're making it happen. And one of the first times I knew I was starting to be successful on talking about it that way. And that was a hard, a hard mind sh uh, shift, I think, because the way politicians run are vote for me, I'll fix everything. All you have to do is vote, vote for me, I solve the problems. It's never like we are going to do this or you have to actually keep showing up after you elect me. It's not often like that. So getting people to change that mindset it happened over time. but. One of the first times I was talking to somebody, I had just met one of her volunteers, and she said, you know, our campaign to end gerrymandering. And I was like, you said our, yes. Because for so long, people would be like, yours, yours. And I was like, it's not mine, this is ours. Like, we're all in this mess. I might have gotten us there, but we're all here. And that really matters, though, because if you don't have that ownership, then I think it's really easy to just look to somebody else to do it. And again, democracy is a participation sport. You have to show up. You know, you know, at different times, maybe you can show up more or show up less, but if all of us are just waiting for somebody else to fix it, then it won't get solved. Um, then, once we finally made it onto the ballot, we finally started getting endorsements. People were like, oh, the crazy group of internet strangers is real. They will show up, they will do stuff. Um, and we really needed those validators throughout the campaign. This ballot was huge, and I know you guys know that more than anybody. We had every congressional seat, every house seat, every senate seat, uh, three uh, total ballot initiatives, two Supreme Court justices, the governor, secretary of state, attorney general, there was a lot to vote on. So although there were a couple thousand of us really, really paying attention to this, in order to try and cut through the noise and get to all the people who would be voting, we really needed to work on those organizations who are more established, where people do go and look for the voter guide, like you guys had created, and 
get that validation or that endorsement from people because there was so much to work on. And thankfully, uh, because of an amazing outreach team and communication effort, we had hundreds of endorsements across the state, from like local knitting clubs to the UAW. It was pretty cool to see that and to see how every community mattered too. Um, then uh, we got a lot of press too. Um, there were actually four states looking to amend the Constitution in uh, 2018 um, when it came to redistricting. So it was us, Missouri, uh, Utah, and uh, wait, okay, Missouri, Colorado. Colorado. Thank you, and Colorado. And then Ohio had done it in the primaries. Um, but uh, we were always, the, well, almost always the first state mentioned. And that was because we were grassroots and scrappy. But that really played to our advantage because the networks that we didn't have because we weren't the normal political players became open to us finally because we were being talked to. So a lot of our largest donors that ended up contributing a lot towards the end actually found us because of large media talking about us. They weren't from Michigan, but they were like, they sound like they're doing it right. Because um, that was one of the hardest parts. Really, for the first year and a half of the campaign, it was all individual grassroots donations making it day after day. We had one large grant from the Beckwith Fund, I think, that uh, is a local Lansing um, group. And besides that, it was all of us funding it. And it gets really expensive when you're up against a Supreme Court challenge and you know looking at a campaign. So then, we make it, we feel good, we beat our goal, we're about to get onto the ballot, and then we get this lawsuit. And we knew it was coming because even before we wrote the language, in the newspapers, our opposition was already saying, their constitutional language is you know, illegal and it's unconstitutional. And I was like, we, don't, we haven't even written it yet. Like, I don't know how you know that. So we knew it was coming, but it's still very scary. Um, we went to the Court of Appeals first. And we had this beautiful three-judge uh, three panel, one Democrat, one Republican, and one kind of independent, or they're technically impartial, but based on their history, it seemed like that. And all of them said, you know, this lawsuit is without merit. They tore it to shreds and they were like, no, they have absolutely every right to use this petition process to amend it, to amend the Constitution for redistricting. But, of course, our opposition appealed that and went up to the Michigan Supreme Court. Uh, Michigan Supreme Court technically is five Republicans, two Democrats. Uh, in the past has a lot of history for being vindictive and trying to vote across party lines. But in Michigan, that is the highest court we can go to. After the Michigan Supreme Court, if they would have decided to keep us off the ballot, we would have been done. Um, we came up with a plan B to still try and keep this relevant, but literally all of the hard work of gathering the signatures, all of that would essentially be thrown out. When we had started, we knew that even if we lost in court, it would be paving the pathway for the people who came after us because there's not a lot of case law on people going through the Supreme Court with a ballot initiative. It's been very few cases, so it's really hard to come up with a legal strategy. So we're like, okay, but that was in the beginning. That's still when it was like a couple hundred of us. Now it's a couple of thousand of us. And I will say that <laughs> that day we got the Supreme Court was probably uh, knowing that we were going there, even though we already had known, that was probably the hardest day for me. Because it literally comes down to seven people that you are just hoping do their job, which means they're interpreting things based on the law and not on politics. And that was the ultimate test. I mean, this whole issue was about that. Redistricting is like, can we actually create a system we can trust again? Um, and then it turned out that you know the justices, their, some of their staff had actually been the ones gerrymandering the time before, and all of these things are coming up, and you're like, it's fine. <laughs> we got to go through it anyway, so might as well put a chipper face on. Um, but we stayed vigilant, and we stayed nonpartisan, and we also showed up. Um, I had this really amazing volunteer, her name was Dora, at the beginning of the campaign. Uh, we had a lot of people from the establishment in general telling us that we shouldn't go forward, we were going to ruin this if we did, that we didn't know what we were doing, we were going to get a lot of people's hopes up, and you know, it was silly. And I talked to her on the phone, and I said, you know, I don't know what to do because I know that we have a lot of people, but I've also never done this before. And I feel, I see the talent, and I know our Constitution says we can, I know I'm allowed to, but should we is different than being allowed to. And she said, you know what, Katie, when you're just one person in a room, it might feel lonely. But then you get two or 10 or even 100. And 100 people in one room looks like a lot. And although you might not have the money and might not have the power, you have people. The actual people, the actual voters who will end up voting on this. The actual people who are supposed to be the ones who are looked out for. So remember that. 
And I, that was the strategy we carried on into the Supreme Court too. We filled up the whole uh, Supreme Court. I actually heard from one of the justices that's the only day it's been completely full, This whole that whole cycle, which is very cool. And then we actually had like three to 400 people outside of the court too, just saying, let us vote. Because really what they were trying to determine was, can redistricting, are the people of Michigan basically smart enough to be able to vote on something as complicated as redistricting? Or should it be left to the professionals to figure out? Um, and so would we be allowed on the ballot or not? And we won. It was a four, two, yes, decision. Um, and Justice Clement, who is one of the justices, had actually been dropped from her fundraising team before the final count was even out. She was being threatened um, by funders and basically some of the establishment and decided to vote based on the law anyways. Um, Justice Viviano, McCormick, and Bernstein all voted for us. Um, and I, it just really restored my faith personally in the ability for our justice system to just do what they're supposed to do, which maybe is a low bar, but you know, better than nothing. Um, we ended up raising lots of money, um, but what was really cool is we had over 16,000 individual donations, which was over 30 times more than any other ballot initiative in the state. Um, all of the, you need this much money beforehand, although that would have been extremely helpful, we found ways around that because of the amount of time and talent people were willing to give the organization. And it would not have been possible without all the many talented people putting in their creativity and energy. Um, we were, for most of the campaign, funded by an extreme majority by uh, the people of the state. And then thankfully we ended up getting a couple of very large donations at the very end, which allowed us to be insulated from some attacks. About 15 days before the election, $4 million was dropped from our opposition. Um, with direct lies, we actually got 17 radio ads pulled down because they had lied so egregiously, which is pretty unheard of, actually. A lot of other people said, oh yeah, our lawyer will get back to you in three weeks. And I was like, oh, after the election. Great. Thank you. Um, but we had enough money to insulate ourselves from that. So what is this thing that we passed? Uh, Independent Citizens Redistricting Commission. So basically, it'll be 13 registered Michigan voters, four from the majority party, four from the minority, and five from independent or third party. Um, so we don't have to register in Michigan what party you vote on, um, but it'll be four Democrats, four Republicans, and five independent or third party voters this first time around. If you are a currently elected politician or you have been within the last five years, um, you will not be able to serve, although you will be able to participate. So um, in California, where they have this, you know, you actually could go and watch some of the video of the local legislator coming and testifying as a member of the public, which is pretty cool to actually see. And I'm saying, like, here's where I live and here's where I think the line should be drawn. Um, but again, you can participate, but kind of like everybody else. Um, if you're a registered lobbyist, and there's a couple other things that are very closely related, then you're not allowed to draw the lines, but again, you are still allowed to participate. Um, the uh, um, voters will actually be central to this. Uh, they can't give one political party or candidate an advantage. Gerrymandering is legal. Our uh, federal Supreme Court has kind of kicked the can down the road time and time again, not really ruling on it unless it's racial gerrymandering. Partisan gerrymandering saying, I am targeting you because you're a Democrat and I want your vote to count less is currently legal, which is crazy. We all hope it will not stay that way. But at the state level, you can make it illegal. That criteria cannot give a political advantage to a person or candidate makes it illegal. <laughs> the people of Michigan are badasses. We made gerrymandering illegal. Uh, it's my favorite, favorite part. Um, and the maps also have to be, uh, when they go to be voted on, at least two of those Democrats, two of the Republicans, and two of the independents all have to agree or the maps can't be adopted. So we're also trying to make sure that there's some fairness there in there. Many other states that have this have a provision like that and it hasn't been an issue in case for some reason, somebody's trying to deadlock it out, it actually goes to a ranked choice voting type of methodology, which is kind of fun. Um, the current process, or the um, new process actually, will be completely open to the public too. So these commissioners will not be able to meet in private. Um, they have to have all public meetings, not more than two of them can meet at a time, and you will actually be invited in. All the data will be made public, you can comment online, um, but actually, part of drawing these maps requires participation. Um, we want people to go and talk about your community and how you want to be represented in Lansing and in Washington, D.C., um, because your representative does want to be able to manage those expectations and be successful in doing that. And so 
part of these public hearings are mandatory. They'll actually have to have 10 before across the state before they even can draw the first maps. So we're trying to set the intention that the people of Michigan are actually much more important than the people who are drawing the maps. Uh, we changed the criteria, so Equal Population, Voting Rights Act, making sure that all the areas are connected. Communities of interest is where you can go and say, you know, we have a, a religious community that extends beyond this technical border and here are the issues that would be important to us at the state level or federal. Or you could say, you know, we have this industry right here that technically goes beyond the city of West Michigan. We have a lot of um, furniture manufacturers, for example. So if all three of them wanted to like map out where their employees are because they wanted to make sure at least somebody was listening to them, um, they could do that. Uh, or in other places, you know, there's been like a really robust like um, market that supplies a lot of income for people and they wanted to go and represent themselves even though technically it's like between two cities where a natural boundary would be. Then respecting city, township, and county boundaries and keeping it relatively compact. Because another thing is if these districts are too crazy or all over the place, even just setting up offices for you to go and visit constituents can be really hard. So we wanted to keep all that in mind. The final result was a 61% win across the state. Yeah. Our initial polling had showed that about 40% of the people even knew what redistricting or gerrymandering was. So then to go to 61% of people voting yes, when they tend to be inclined to vote no and they don't know what it is, was really important. But one of my favorite parts is if you look at all of those green areas, that was all a very solid win. The yellow, orange color is like between 40 and 49.9%, but in most communities, it was about 100 voters that, did, that voted uh, between 51% or not. And then we only had one that was less than 40%. But if you compare this to the governor or a lot of the uh, races that Democrats won, it's far fewer counties because most of our population lives in East Michigan. So the really cool thing about this to me meant that us having canvassing teams in the UP, us having you know canvassing teams uh, in the South, in the middle, everywhere, it mattered. In New Diego County, we won by one vote, which I just love. Uh, <laughs> it mattered, and why that matters so much is, although yes, changing the system was important, if we want the system to work, we need people to believe in it and actually have some faith in our democracy again. So for the first time, when normally these decisions that impact 10 years of elections at a time is going to happen, um, millions of people will be invited into that room instead of only a couple. And this shows me that a lot of those people know what it is and are hopefully gonna participate. Um, we've designed this so that it should, the 13 people should actually be representative. It should take into account the demographics of the state. So economic income, race, gender, we should actually have 13 people who somewhat look like Michiganders, which is really exciting, age groups too. But that only happens if people from all parts of the state actually apply to be on the commission, because you have to opt in. But this shows me that we have the best building block to go from in order to demand that, because it wasn't just, you know, really blue areas or really red areas, it was really across the state that we saw a lot of uh, success. Okay. Um, do you have a few moments for questions? Sure. Sure. Okay. Uh, those who would like to leave because of a certain basketball game, we <laughs> certainly understand, but uh, Katie has uh, graciously, as you heard, agreed to take some questions. And uh, I was remiss in not thanking Roger Rail, uh, who volunteered his services today to the <laughs> video and presentation that hopefully you will share with some of your friends who might find it as valuable as we did. Thank you, yes. Um, and just so you guys know, so now that we have that success, we will be working to implement this policy. Um, there's a couple different ways that that needs to happen. Um, basically, we need to make sure that if there is an attack legislatively, that we are ready to help with that. We had this amazing amount of research that we did towards this, um, but you know, often legal tactics are a way that people try and uh, uh, make sure that the wheel of the policy isn't followed. Um, we had a little bit of that during lame duck. We had volunteers step up. The campaign was ready, and although we didn't get the bill that made uh, the petition process harder, eliminated the one that was going after our specific proposal, never made it to a vote, which is only because people stay vigilant. Yeah. 
Um, the other thing is we want to advocate. So we need to mobilize people. We want people from all those communities to not only show up and apply to be on the commission, but actually come and talk about how do we want representation to look. I just like cannot get over how exciting that is because like to actually say like, look, if these are the things I want my legislator in Lansing and in Washington DC to pay attention to, we've never been able to do that before. So helping communities understand how to do that. Some cities have city planners who go around and already do that, but you know, some don't too, especially some of the, those harder to reach communities. So how can all of us help facilitate that process. And also, we just spent about $11 million on TV. So hopefully everybody saw our 30 second commercial about <laughs> here's the problem, here's the solution, vote yes. But knowing that, this should hopefully be in the back of people's minds still. Um, technically the new maps won't be instated until 2022, but knowing we just spent all that money and energy talking to so many people about this, we have a really unique opportunity to actually go and continue that education and to continue to talk about what does this mean and how does participating look. Because um, we've never been allowed to before. So especially making sure people know that not only can you, but you really should is really um, important. Um, just to go over a timeline, so January 1st of 2020, uh, the applications will actually be open for you to apply, so please feel free to take out your calendar and mark it on there as a reminder to check out the Secretary of State website. Um, I'm sure it will pass along too, but um, then the applications close in June, so the Secretary of State will mail out some applications. Uh, if you get chosen through there, you can opt in to do it, but otherwise any registered Michigan voter can apply to be on the commission. Uh, there's a sorting and random selection for the commission. Um, I have another slide but also on our website it kind of goes through the process but basically that means the first round of applicants will be whittled down um, and ready to go between June and September and then the commission will actually start October 15th of 2020. So then from October 15th going into 2021 um, the census data will come back, so they can hold all of those initial meetings, hearing from communities beforehand. They can't really start even drawing maps until we have that official census data, because you have to make sure, again, equal population, and you actually know where communities have shifted. Um, and then through November 1st of 2021, the commission will hold those 10 meetings uh, before drafting the plan, and then they'll draft the plan, and they can maybe hold more meetings, it's up to them. But they then have to have five meetings after they've drawn the maps, to go and get feedback and say like, did we listen good enough? Or are there other things that you've thought of? Or are there more communities you want to come give a say? And any map that they are producing in hopes of voting for, I think there's a 45 day window where they have to actually show it to the public first. So you should have ample time to communicate. And then of course, organizations like ours are gonna be making sure that you know and you can see and give your input. Um, and then by November 1st of 2021, the commission will adopt the final map. So they'll have to have that final vote on it. But really, getting people to apply and then getting people to show up to those meetings and also look at the maps and hold a conversation about what does this look like. Um, then we have the first primary election using the maps and then the first on August 2nd and then the first general election using the maps. So from November to August, that's when candidates will be figuring out who's the new, you know, what's my new district, how does it actually look? Well, I'll all be able to look and say, look at that non-gerrymandered election map. How beautiful is that? Um, <laughs> and then the first general election. I think it's really important that we get this right the first time we're doing it because it will hopefully set precedent for in 10 years from now, them having a good first way that it worked. We have a lot of great examples of other states, but then also we're working with the states that did pass this, Colorado, Missouri, Utah, um, although they have different systems, we're all talking about implementation. So hopefully, you know, lessons learned across the country, people will be learning how to participate in this process. Um, so right now, Voters on Politicians is going uh, uh, across the state again to talk about different issues. So on our website, I know we have different ways that you can log on to those, but we're going around and talking about you know those implementation plans, but also what's the next issue. We have a lot of people who now have learned who the Board of Canvassers are. Um, <laughs> maybe we didn't know who they were before, and now we know them. Um, we've learned how to you know follow the rules of the petition, and we're hungry for more direct democracy. Um, and so going, well, we're talking about a lot of things from ethics and transparency in government, money and politics, voting rights and access, and if you show up to one of those meetings, you'll be able to um, give some feedback on, you know, what one of those you might want uh, to participate in. Um, and 
Lastly, let me see here. I uh, will tell you what I'm doing, and then I'm happy to take questions, so thanks for your patience. Um, so uh, uh, one of the coolest things about being the person who accidentally amended the Constitution through a Facebook post, and you guys know a lot more than just me, but was that when we did get shared in things like the New York Times, um, or even across Michigan, a lot of people saw themselves for the first time being able to enact change. They were like, if some 26-year-old in Michigan can get people riled up about something as boring as gerrymandering and like get them really riled up where they just you know, went against the political establishment and gathered all these signatures with no money and you know, maybe I can do X or Y or Z. And I had so many people reach out to us and it was really hard to not try and help them because when we first started, I cannot express how lonely it was to try and get anybody who would help who was from kind of the, the status quo. Um, a lot of people who would grab pancakes, but that was about it. Um, <laughs> and the people who actually in the organizations who first started helping us were all from out of Michigan. I don't know if they just didn't know better or what, but. Um, so I understood and got my eyes open to all the reasons why you would quit. I got like why a lot of people don't try and do this process. Because even something like trying to figure out campaign finance in Michigan, you have to like attend a webinar on a Wednesday at 9 a.m. So I had to take a vacation day from work to go do that. You know, all these little hoops that you don't think about. Um, and so, a uh, quick story on that. You know, I uh, was in Colorado speaking at something and this guy sat down next to me and I was like, hi, I'm Katie. And he goes, are you Katie Fahey by chance? And I was like, well, yes I am. Uh, who are you? And he's like, I'm one of your donors. And I was like, oh my gosh, hey, what are you doing in Colorado? How's it going? And uh, I was like, oh, I'm from Grand Rapids. Where are you from? And he's like, I don't know where that is. And I was like, oh, that's weird. Uh, it's on the west side of the state. Um, but it turns out he was from New Mexico. And I was like, oh, oh my gosh, thanks for donating. Why did you do that? I'm really happy you did, but why? And he said, you know, I was reading about us in the New York Times. And my whole life, I have been so mad that we only run as Democrat or Republican. And then I see you guys being nonpartisan, throwing caution to the wind. And he goes, for the first time, it actually got me to get off the couch. And I decided that if you could figure out how to do this, no offense, I was like, taken, <laughs> that, that I could get off my butt and run as an independent for the state house in New Mexico because of voters, not politicians in Michigan. And he said, and afterwards I get told, you know, if I vote for you, doesn't that mean I'm throwing my vote away or whatever? And I show them your website, and I show them what you guys are doing, and I say, if somebody can start amending the Constitution with a Facebook post, we can get an independent to win for the House in New Mexico. And I was like, that's awesome. Uh, and one of the front runners ended up actually having to drop out, so he was one of the front runners in the race. I have not seen if he won or not um, on YouTube. Uh, but that really left an impact on me, where I was like, the talking about this and helping people see and envision things is very different. Um, from the campaign, we had seven different people leave to run for local office because for the first time they saw that how to organize and how to do a campaign, all of them won, which is super cool for like local school board and stuff like that. And then we had even more in the second round that decided to. But being able to actually open that door and be the people who don't just say, no, your idea is too silly or that sounds too hard is really important. And so. Um, we got connected with a group to kind of try and take our story national called The People. Um, and they're all about bringing Democrats and Republicans and independents together to find common ground and then take action. Um, so we're having a couple meetings there too. These are separate than the Voters Not Politicians Town Halls, which you should also go to. Um, we're looking for one over here, so it's gonna help me organize it. But basically it's starting with a conversation between equal numbers of Democrats, Republicans, and independents and going from there. But really that's where um, I'm focusing a lot of my energy right now to really see what is the potential, especially between now and 2020, when we have an unprecedented and recent time amount of people looking to get involved and looking to participate. We've had people reach out to us, you know, from Arkansas who want to like organize local ordinances and um, and across the country. In Florida, there's an open primary campaign because of us. Um, not that we started, we just inspired. So really focusing there. Um, so I'm happy to take any questions, but I think like my last kind of piece is that after the lame duck session, um, they made it harder to gather petitions here in Michigan. And this moment that should have been like really happy, I was just mad. 
It was just really mad. I, I mean, I was mad in the first place that like thousands of us had to put our lives on hold in order to do this. Like, although this is an absolutely incredible story, I feel like it should be on a different page. Right? But <laughs> and it was like charming and like fun, and I think we made like this big volunteer family across the state, which has like inspired me to think Michigan's awesome forever. But like thousands of us shouldn't have had to put our lives on hold in order to try and do what's right. In order to pass something that clearly 61%, 2.5 million people in this state wanted anyways. And that's why I'm mad. <laughs> because, you know, again, this experience has been incredible, but it shouldn't have to be this way. And then for our legislature to take the most like unprecedented campaign that could have taught us a lot about being nonpartisan, about how to actually mobilize people and try and make democracy easier to access, they made the rules harder for everybody who comes after us. In the blink of an eye with a super poorly written law. And I will not stand for that personally, because they did not ask our opinion <laughs> on how that should go. And we are some of the constituents who would know a lot about how the, how the petition process could be improved. And there are ways it could be improved. Those were not any of them. Um, and so I think um, for, I guess, the lasting thing that has stayed with me is that our democracy will continue to need def defending. We have made a lot of great progress, and it is possible, but we have a lot more work to do. Um, I can't wait until the day I can go back to like business or the nonprofit world and be out of politics and not worry about this, but at least for now, um, I think we have done something that really the country is looking at and so many people are excited to learn from all the people who've been volunteers or participants. Thank you. I'm sure we could uh, go on and on with this, but we do have to vacate about four o'clock uh, this facility. So, Great. You want to try? Oh. Yeah, if there's a couple quick questions, I can take them. But yeah. Uh, if you're interested in what you should do next in terms of referendum, uh, I think just getting rid of the name drop. Yeah, getting rid of the name drop. I know there's a, there's a group for that. There's a group for voting. And, but do you, do you know the next meeting where you know? Tuesday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi everybody, I'm Rita Bash and I was the outreach chair during the campaign. I did most of the um, but in terms of what comes next for voters, not politicians, we are determined to see this through, right? We've, we are all excited and celebrating the milestone of actually amending the Constitution, but we're not done yet. We don't have those beautiful non-gerrymandered maps. And so we're not going to be done until 2022. So for the next two years, um, Voters on Politicians is still going to be around. And we are really focused on recruiting an even bigger volunteer army to help with this implementation. Katie had one slide that talked about it. But the next thing that we're doing, and please take that slide off, okay. uh, <laughs> uh, we are doing another series of town halls during the next month. Um, and those town halls will be focused on sort of kicking off educating the public about implementation of the redistricting commission, but also doing exactly what the very first questioner mentioned, which is talking to people about other democracy reform initiatives and sort of doing a listening tour. So just like two years ago in March of 2017, we went across the state and explained what is redistricting, what is gerrymandering, how do you want to fix it. We're doing something very similar. We're going to go across the state and say, by the way, this is the who, what, when, where, why, and how of the new constitutional redistricting process in Michigan and oh by the way let's have a conversation and let's listen to each other about what other democracy reforms you want to go to uh, what what should we work on next basically so we're not going to do that today because we are out of time um, but there is a whole series if you can go on the voters not politicians website at backslash events you can see a list. You can go on the Voters Not Politicians Facebook page and see a list of events that are coming up. And we're adding a few more. Um, we're not quite at 33 in 33 days. I think we're at 28 right now, but we're adding a few more. 
The very next one in our area is uh, Tuesday night at ja in Jackson at the Carnegie Library. And then this Wednesday night, the League of Women Voters is hosting us, and so we're gonna do a town hall, um, and that's at the Pointless Brewery Theater on Packard at 7.30. And that one will be primarily focused on implementation, what comes next with implementation. But hopefully you guys can join us for one of these other town halls that will include both what comes next for implementation and what comes next in democracy reform. Great. Yeah. I have two quick questions. Yeah. The first one is, uh, at one point you said four Democrats and four Republicans. Another time you said four of the majority and minority mm -hmm. um, party. So I'm wondering, is, are there provisions in there for if, let's say, the Green Party became the yeah. majority? Yeah, so the constitutional language is written so that it says four people from the majority party from the most recent election and four from the minority from the most recent election. So this first upcoming time will be Democrats and Republicans, but if a third party uh, gets more votes than either the Democrats or the Republicans in the state, they will have four seats. And the other question is, given what was just said, what is the soonest that you might partner with another group for getting another ballot initiative um, yeah, so we're definitely talking about doing an initiative now. Um, if you're already working on one, please let us know, because um, we're looking at how do we assist and want to work with other people, and then we're also looking through those town halls at what issue do we want to take on next. So 2020 is not out of the question. Yeah, 2020 is not out of the question. Yeah. Other states contacted you? Yes, have other states contacted us? Yes, I was just talking to the governor of, oh shoot, Kansas or something? <laughs> Sorry, or Oklahoma. Um, <laughs> but yeah, but yeah, I think um, what's really interesting is the four states that did pass this all passed them in very different ways. We were the only one to be as grassroots as we were. Um, but I think it makes it really exciting, and especially the thought of not having to pay for signatures is exciting to people. Uh, I most often have to say, you just have to actually be authentic about engaging people. <laughs> um, but yeah, other the advice is followed, I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. Katie, thank you for these lessons. Um, why didn't voters, not politicians, uh, spearhead a referendum on the ballot change requirement where we all, I might understand there was one route where we all got a bunch of signatures we could have overridden the changes. I was just wondering yeah. what was going through. Your yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so there was a really brief period after the lame duck session where we could have tried to appeal the law that was written by the legislature and then have people vote on it again. Um, but when we were looking at it, even to do the funding for printing petitions and everything was like not in the cards. We had to pretty much spend everything during the election. Um, so we tried to talk to other groups about what other funding might be out there who was really serious about it and made the call that, you know, instead of being reactive, if we can be proactive on something, we think we'll actually be able to, to have better progress on it. So one of the potential options for what we may end up doing is actually trying to improve the ballot initiative process, whether that'll be the top from everybody that we're going around and talking to, I'm not sure, but I think we're definitely interested in still trying to improve it. It's just extremely unfortunate that through the lame duck session that that many laws can be passed so quickly and so poorly, and we don't have an efficient way to respond to that unless we want to do another constitutional amendment completely addressing that part of law, which is in the potentially in the cards. Yeah. Would this have uh, passed given the new rules for positions? Did have yeah, so the question is, with the new rules for petitioning, would this have passed? And actually, yes, ours would have, but the number one groups that probably would be impacted are especially those groups working out of Detroit, um, who have spearheaded a lot of ones like the minimum wage campaign, and I think that is egregious that you would take some of the most impacted and pretty much be targeting them to try and make sure that they cannot be as successful as they have been in the past. Um, we did really well because Unlike most campaigns, we did try and go in rural and urban parts of the state, but that can be really hard to do, especially if you're not used to online organizing. Yeah. Uh, Jess, Jesselyn Benson recently uh, wanted to settle an ongoing gerrymandering suit. Uh -huh. She caught a lot of flack from some legislators. How does that impact on what this particular effort is? Great question, yeah. So there was a lawsuit uh, spearheaded by the League of Women Voters against the current set of maps, saying that they were drawn illegally to try and make some voters' votes count more and some voters' votes count less. Um, if 
that lawsuit is successful, it will actually mean that the maps will be redrawn before the 2020 election, um, saying that you know for this next round we should have impartial districts in some of those areas. What our constitutional amendment did could not impact maps that had already be, been drawn. It can't re retroactively change that. It can only impact the maps being drawn from now on. So our maps are 2020 and every election after that, but those ones are just be for the maps right now that go through 2022. So, yeah, which is still a couple more elections, which is why if it could pass, you know, because you know, it, it, looking at it from a pure party standpoint, I think Democrats, you guys probably know better than I do, won the state either seven or nine percent total, yet the state house and the state senate are still for the Republican Party because they were gerrymandered that way. Um, again, Democrats have also gerrymandered the state. But then you have a, a governor, a secretary of state, and an attorney general who are one party dealing with a legislature that doesn't have a majority in either, even though many more Michiganders turn out to vote the other way. So. So it makes it hard to even govern or have people feel like when they vote it matters. Because if you still have all that conflict and nothing's happening, then people are like, why did I vote? Why did I show up? I voted for the right person. Didn't matter anyways. And that's what I'm hoping yeah. this changes more than anything. Institutional trust in government, in elections, and in institutions is at an all-time low in our American history. If we don't start solving that, like when there's too much distrust, people want to throw it all out. They want to like, Revolt and do all that other stuff. And I personally, if we can try and fix it, sounds good. All the way in the back. Last question. Last what, question. What's the name of the two justices who voted nay when we went to the mission? <laughs> there are three justices. Oh gosh, I should know their names. Excuse can me. I have some help? Curtis Wilder, who didn't actually end up winning re election. Um, Mark yeah, uh, Markman, who is the. Yeah, Robert Markman, who is the uh, head. Oh, Stephen Markman? Thank you. The Chief Justice, yeah. Was, was, was the Chief Justice, yes. Now Bridget is. Uh, and I should know. I used to know. <laughs> I can let you know. <laughs> uh, we will be putting the Voters Not Politicians events into our newsletter. So you can, you can find out about them there. Uh, I'm proud to say that when we did our survey post-distribution of the Voter Guide post-election, 70% of them plus said that they used it to decide who to vote for for the state Supreme Court. And since we had perhaps a million people look at those, uh, clearly we made a big contribution to that. So um, we need to thank Katie for the profound, profound contribution she and voters, not politicians, have made to democracy in this state and by example in this country. So thank you so much for coming to